I'm Dr. Craig Eskude, the host of IDD Health Matters, a podcast where we talk about health, wellness, and health equity for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to today's podcast, IDD Health Matters. I have two great guests with us today. I have Jess Jacobs and Nanette Robel. And I'm going to start off by just asking you to introduce yourselves and what you do in this field and your ties to this field. And tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit how you got into this field. Nanette? Well, thank you, Craig. Um, so I'm a pharmacist and I work for a company called Terrytown Expo Care Pharmacy. We are what we quote as America's number one IDD pharmacy. And uh, we service a number of different states, about uh, 23,000 individuals in about 28 states. And uh, we primarily provide medication and medication solutions to facilities, group homes, uh, where individuals with developmental disability live or reside. And uh, I've actually been in this field for almost 40 years. How did I get into this field? It's a funny story, actually. Uh, I started uh, reading the newspaper for a job. I w was working at a hospital at the time, thought I would tr like to try something new. Took a job in a consulting pharmacy, which I knew nothing about. And uh, on the very first day that I was there, they said to me, you're the low man on the totem pole. Why don't you go to this facility? Because none of us know what to do with them. So I got in my car, drove to the facility. And as I was walking up to the facility, one of the young ladies came out the door, threw her arms around me, gave me a great big hug and kiss, and said, I love you, I love you, I love you. Can I show you my bedroom? And that was my start to IDD field, and I fell in love with the individuals. You know, that's a great, fascinating story, and, what, and it illustrates a point that I, that I talk about occasionally. You know, you know right away when, yes. when you start working in this field, either it's for you or it's not. Exactly. And when it grabs you, you're in it for life. That is absolutely true. Yeah. And if it has to grab your heart as well as your head. Yeah. And it, it sounds like it grabbed your heart. Jess? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, so I, like Nanette, also work for Terrytown Expo Care Pharmacy. I will not reiterate the great things that we do. I will say that I am a pharmacy technician by trade and previously worked with the mentally ill and behavioral health individuals expanded my horizon into working with a few developmentally disabled agencies and had the opportunity to come to a company that serves exclusively developmentally disabled. So like you said, once it grabs onto your heart, you are, you're a lifer. So here I am, very happy to be here and supporting our individuals. Excellent. So when it comes to pharmacy services in this field, um, and I'll, you decide who to, who to answer this first, but what, what would you say is maybe a little different in providing pharmacy services or what does, what does Terrytown do? That's a little, little different than say regular pharmacy services. And why is that important? So one thing that I will hit on just as that pharmacy technician background is the operations and processes that we have in place to ensure our individuals are not going without their medication. We obviously don't want any lapse in their therapy, and Terrytown is working proactively to ensure that we are getting those refills for the individuals. And our goal is really to take away that pharmacy work that the agency staff is doing and put it back on the pharmacies to where they can start accelerating their care for the individuals. So I know, N Nanette, you do a lot of education as well, too, right? So is that a component that you would say is... Part of yes, the so field. A absolutely, and I think you know there's a lot of pharmacies out there that can provide medications, uh, and and certainly others that serve this this uh, field. But one of the things that we put a big emphasis on is the individuals that we work with have needs that are really unique, and the nursing staff, the director staff, the uh, social workers in the agencies. And quite honestly, I will say many times the nurses and physicians who work in these agencies need a lot of education, not only based on the fact that they are seeing uh, an individual who may not be able to communicate with them, 
but also our individuals may have some unique parts uh, or, or unique aspects because of the, their disabilities. And so we really train a lot on disease states, but in relation to how they look how, with an individual with IDD and how they may be different. So I, I'm going to get a little clinical here because I think this is important and, it, and it's of interest. There are some medications that we, we know that are used more frequently in people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and some of those have some significant complications. Not, nothing specific, but, but in, in general, um, what, are, what are some of the, the, the challenges met from a medication standpoint and some of the, the, the concerns that you know, people who maybe are out there who work in this field or know people with disabilities might, you, you, you think might, it might be important for them to know about? So I think there's probably two things, Craig. The first is the is what I mentioned before. These are not individuals who come up to us and say, you know what, I'm having an aura and I think I might be starting to have a seizure. They may not be able to communicate that way at all. So it is incumbent on the staff to put the pieces together of how that individual is acting to try and discern what some of their needs are. So that's one aspect that makes it very different and very unique. The other one is uh, these individuals are not necessarily their own advocates. So while you and I may go to a physician and say, you know what, I've been taking this medication for a long time. I'm concerned about this particular side effect that I might might be having. I'm, I'm aging. I'm concerned about osteoporosis or whatever it happens to be. Uh, can we talk about that? These individuals can't. And so we really rely on the, on the nursing staff to be those advocates. And, and quite honestly, I hope that us in the pharmacy are advocates for them too, teaching them how to approach the clinician and make some suggestions on, and I'm not saying that older medications are not effective, but we have a lot of newer medications that look at a couple of things. They look at uh, the seizure or the side effect profile, and they look at simple things like drug interactions that may have been improved and efficacy that may be improved that unless somebody might suggest that to a clinician, it, it just continues to go. You know, I think that's one of the nuances of this field in, in general, and it's not specific to healthcare, uh, the healthcare provider part of this field is looking at how people communicate things differently. And that includes side effects of medications. Um, you know, uh, let's say, uh, let's say I'm taking a particular medication and it makes me nauseated. Well, I'm going to be able to recognize that and express that, you know, my stomach is upset every time I take this, I don't want to eat. Can you change me to another medication or whatever? But someone who can't communicate that, how might that appear? How might they express, say, nausea uh, from a side effect when they can't tell you that? I think that's a really great question. And as we continue to work with our individuals, really pulling your resources together and your staff. Um, I know we've given the example where an individual may come up to you and be holding their stomach or pulling at their clothes and just trying to somehow communicate to you that their stomach is upset and really having your resources, pulling your DSPs together and your other staff to ensure this isn't a normal action or behavior that they're doing. And um, it's a guess of putting that together. So you said the word I was kind of looking at looking for is behaviors. People may communicate things non-verbally and they often communicate through behaviors. You know, and it, if I'm very nauseated and someone's making me eat or giving me food and they keep on trying to do that, I might become agitated or aggressive. I might knock the plate away or, or you know, start to refuse to go to the dinner table to eat. And sometimes we might confuse that as, well, this person's being non-compliant or whatever, when actually they're experiencing, say, a medication side effect or something else that might be going on. And I think that's one of the biggest things that, that you know, you, you can do and you, what we all try to do is to provide that type of or orientation and understanding to people who work in this field because so many of those things can make such a, a, a positive impact in a person's life when we're able to recognize those things. So we're talking a lot about health issues, health equity uh, in this field. Are there any particular challenges that, that you recognize in this field that um, make equitable health care and people with disabilities receiving equitable health care a little bit difficult? 
Uh, you know, I think the answer to that s- certainly is yes. And, uh, you know, just as, as an aside, when I was going through pharmacy school, we never even considered that there was a population of IDD. We didn't learn anything about IDD. We didn't know that they were... Same thing same thing. Schools, yes, nursing schools. Right. Uh, and none of us had that exposure. Quite honestly, if you had exposure, it was because you had a friend or a neighbor or, ch- or a child uh, with a disability. But as a whole, we never looked to that population as going to need medical needs. The other thing I will say is when I started in this population, and yes, I'm aging myself, the average individual would live to about 22 years old. Today, we see individuals that are much older and, of course, the whole plethora of medical issues. We have not been prepared to address some of those. Uh, You know, even yesterday, I gave a talk on uh, the elderly in this population and then some of the things that we should be looking for, which, quite honestly, even 15 or 20 years ago, I wouldn't be talking about. But some of the nuances of the aging process on top of IDD, I think, that do make the them in a position where they're not getting necessarily the best care or the best thought process and, and how to continue to take care of their health care needs just because we haven't had that experience. Yeah. You know, it, when you um, don't live past your 20s, you're likely not going to develop arthritis. But but again, thanks to a lot of the things that that we that have been happening, that's been positive in this field. People are living a lot longer, so now they have the luxury of experiencing yes. the things that we all experience yes, exactly. as we get older. Oh, my back hurts, uh, you know, or, or arthritis pains, or vision changes that we see as we get older. Maybe a person might you know used to enjoy looking at magazines and stuff stuff, but now they throw them out or they don't want to do it anymore and they're not just being again non-compliant maybe they can't see anymore and they need glasses as what we what happens to many of us as, as we get older so it's important that we all do think about those those things as we age and you're right we we need to learn about those uh so good points now what about um some positive things that you that you have seen are there some positive movements either in in specific company that you work in or the areas that you work or in general that you that you're seeing that are having positive impacts in this field i think first and foremost just the fact that with the advancements we've had whether it be through medications or therapies the lifespan has already significantly increased over the last 15 20 years so continuing to look at our different resources and make sure that those are readily available is obviously making a positive impact on our individuals. Yeah. Um, you know, the the other thing that I would say in terms of a positive impact that I see, uh, and, and I will take it as a personal experience, uh, you know, a number of years ago, I started working with a nurse. And that at the time that I started working with her, that was unheard of that a nurse and a, and a pharmacist would work together because quite honestly, our egos clashed. Pharmacists are far smarter than nurses. Why would I deign to, to work with a, with a nurse? Was the you haven't end- even brought physician egos right. into I that haven't mix, done right? That, right? Yeah, let's so not that, do that. <laughs> so that was the general thought. So when we basically started working together as a team, the benefit that I saw was my nurse said to me, Nanette, stop looking at the written word look at the person. And she taught me that very, very early in my career. And every day that I work with nurses, physicians, uh, other healthcare providers, therapists, like Jess said, I think as a team, we're much more collaborative today uh, instead of being in our own silos. You know, we, gosh, what a great point. I mean, we think about this, we kind of do have our own little turfs and we don't want people to encroach upon them. But when we see that, that as what a team looks like, then that's not really the best thing. What we really need to look at it as is, okay, what can these other people bring to this? What can I learn from them? Because yes, I've got my skills in my particular area, but there are people that have skills in these other areas and, and abilities to recognize things that maybe I don't pay as much attention to. And and that goes to the inter- interdisciplinary approach and, and the team approach and working together to to help provide the best supports and services and, and care and health care and all of that. And and there, there's a the tremendous value in that. And that, again, that's something I kind of had to learn the hard way as well, too, you know. And the other thing, too, Craig, you know, just speaking from 
you know, I'm a pharmacist, so I'm going to speak from the pharmacy standpoint. When I graduated from pharmacy school, there was three anesthesia medications on the market. There are now 36. Wow. And we still have the need for the development of more. So what I see is the development of medications that are much better at pinpointing a mechanism of action that helps a particular disease state and also really looking at side effects and drug interactions and trying to minimize those as much as possible. So I think that the the medications that we're using are getting more de- refined. And so I think that's a, a, a great aspect to what, you know, w- what we see out there. You know, I, it it's, makes me think of something else that I think is an important point to, to remember. There's... I think sometimes we might have the mindset that the seizure is the, um, the the full target, let's say. But we know that people it, with with in this field, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, often have the most complex and challenging seizure conditions. And maybe sometimes a medication can still be determined to be effective, even though their number of seizures may not necessarily go down much, but maybe they're much shorter. Maybe that sleepy, groggy phase we call the postictal phase afterwards doesn't last as long. And those are things that can improve the quality of life of that person and their ability to, to function and to interact. So it's not always about the number of, of seizures, but like you said, all those little nuances and being more specifically targeted and, and, and targeting you know uh, certain symptoms or a seizure, a seizure or whatever, whatever can still have a positive impact, even if we don't see the number of seizures going down. And I think that's it's still an improvement and, a, and an advancement. It's absolutely an improvement. And, and you know, when we look at that, we also have to bear in mind that these individuals are very mobile. So they are not sitting waiting for us to pass medications to them. They are up and about and, in, you know, hopefully enjoying life as well as anybody with a normal intellect would have. And for that reason alone, we, you know, these advantages have really helped with them. So not having that groggy state after that seizure can really impact the fact, well, now I can get out and, and, you know, be with my friends and do things and, you know, go to the grocery store and cook a meal or whatever it happens to be that they're doing. And so I'm going to put in a plug for one of my little, little pet peeves here. That's why it's important to have an accurate seizure record. If you work in this field, it's really important not just to put a check, oh, the person had a seizure, but to give details. How long did the seizure last? What did, what did the symptoms, what were they like afterwards? Did they require an additional medication to stop the seizure? All of those things are so helpful to a clinician in making decisions on medication changes and adjustments. So that's my little plug for, for seizure records. And here's my little plug back to you. We have tried for about 25 years to get the drug companies to come up with a seizure record that we could use universally because our individuals uh, not only are mobile and can go from state to state, but for instance, the Developmental Disability Nursing Estate, State uh, Association needs a standardized form so we all talk the same language. So Dr. Craig, that would be wonderful if you would come up with that form. Thank you so much. Well, you know, I'll look into it no i i agree um and and actually we do kind of have a form that we recommend but you know there there is there are a lot there are lots of very varying forms for lots of different things that all give about the same information and a standardized form would be helpful uh someone made that that point in a in a different episode here where we were talking about health passports and that they're 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 a great tool but they're different types and different, you know, they're not standardized. So you have kind of have to get used to using one particular one. And if that person goes to a doctor and a different one is brought, then then the information's in a different place. But again, how do you get the adoption, you know, of a standardized form across the entire country? I guess it would have to be mandated by some authoritative body and that can be a challenge. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. Friends for Life Residential Care, specializing in support for individuals with developmental disabilities, offers services like adult day support and home health care. Emphasizing empowerment and quality of life, we live by the motto, my ability is stronger than my disability. We are currently hiring, welcoming those passionate about making a difference. Learn more and explore career opportunities at friendsforliferc.com.
I'm Dr. Craig Eskide, President of Intellectability. State developmental disability agencies, managed care organizations, and providers across the United States use Intellectability's health risk screening tool, eLearn courses, and person-centered training to improve health equity for people with IDD. Visit ReplacingRisks.com to learn more about how you can employ these tools with people you support. All right, so we're at the, the part in, in this uh, talk here where we're going to do a little thing I call three and three. Okay? okay. And it's not basketball. Uh, so <laughs> what, what I'm going to do, and, and Jess, you get to go first because it's going to make it harder for her. So... <laughs> so I'm going to give you three minutes and I want you to tell the audience about three things that you think the audience can do, participate in, uh, work towards in, in any area related to improving the health, wellness, support services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Okay. okay? All right. And. That shouldn't be an issue. I okay. think we'll be okay. All right. Well, if you finish early, I'm going to ask some more questions. So. Great. Go. <laughs> All right. So three and three. Let's do the first one would be, again, just communicating, networking with your other peers, staff members, individuals. Try and get as much information as you possibly can to ensure that, again, we're educated. We know what's happening. And just in the 24 hours that I have been here and walked around with several of the nurses that are here, I have learned everyone has a story and everyone has a different resource. And if we all just come together and really utilize those, I think that care will be a little bit more streamlined. My other one is going to be, it's still going to just hone in on the education piece. There are multiple different education opportunities, whether it be a conference like this or a monthly webinar or something that's local, a dinner program. There are multiple opportunities that unfortunately we don't all have the ability to know about. So really just getting the word out and ensuring we're all on the same page with serving our individuals. Yeah. So those are two. Yeah. You got a third? <laughs> And I'm going to give you a moment to think. So she's talking about the conference in here, and I didn't mention this earlier in the podcast, but we are, again, at the Developmental Disabilities Nurses Association Conference in New Orleans, Louisiana. So that's the conference we're, we're referencing here. And, you know, in other episodes, we've talked about the, the, the organization and how great it is, and you're going to hear more about it as well, too. But that's this is another one of those episodes from that conference. So what's your number three? Number three is... You to remember your why. Don't forget why we are doing what we are doing and who we are doing it for. Um, like you mentioned earlier, you're either very passionate about the individuals and the industry, or unfortunately, it's just not your jam. And when you come across, again, honing back in on the conference here, this group of individuals, there's power in numbers, and we are all so much better together. And just bringing our resources and making sure that communication is there. Great, you did you did well. You came in close enough to time. So, all right. So, Nanette, I'm going to challenge you to come up with three things, and you can think about it in a different way. And I'll give you a little hint. Maybe something local, something yeah. state, something national. You know, look okay. at it anyway. But yeah, you know, three th three things or so that you you say you know can make a difference. Well, I will tell you, Jesse was so articulate in her. In her answers, no, that you can't just say she it is. Great is she did no, great. Gonna, you're never going to get off. No, of it I doesn't me. doesn't mean not get off of it. But I'm going to take it from a different approach. And my approach would be really to challenge yourself, wherever you are, whoever you are, to actually get out and volunteer at some of these these uh, facilities. Uh, I know when I first started, as I said, I didn't have any experience with individuals with developmental disabilities. That's one of the things that uh, my coworker and I did was volunteer at every uh, opportunity we could, not only because it really sees, uh, you really get the chance to see those individuals, but you also get to see the chance to see the incredible workers 
that are with our individuals. And, you know, Jesse talked about something, you know, about why, why we're doing this. If you can do something that speaks to your heart, as well as your mind, I think you're so much better off. So that was one thing that I would say is volunteer. So the second thing I would say is take the opportunity, and just talked about this a little bit, but take the opportunity for some unusual sources of education. So not only conferences, maybe, but you know some of our drug companies have uh, educational opportunities. They, there's a lot of support. It doesn't even have to be tied to a particular med- medication. It could be a disease state. Get out there as much as you can, and I know we all have very, very busy days, but to tell you the truth, you can't learn about new medications, for instance, just on the television. First of all, the side effects are way too fast for you to even understand. So that's uh, that's the second thing. Uh, And then uh, the third thing is just keep your mind open. Uh, You know, I will tell you, as I said, I've been in this Ford uh, field for 40 years. I learn something new every single day, and I learn that not only for, from the people that I serve, but also from my colleagues, also from other uh, healthcare providers, uh, just people, parents. Um, you know, I sometimes I get uh, um, emails from a parent who was referred to me by a nurse, you know, just asking for some help with their child or their their loved one, and keep yourself open to that, and and never say no as much as you possibly can. Those are three great. Great things there, and I don't even know what time it is. So we'll just say that you did you did wonderful too. Everybody, everybody gets a gold star oh, today. Okay. How about that? And I'm sure my alarm's going to go off in a second, so just ignore <laughs> it. Um, any any final thoughts? Any anything else you'd, you'd like to say or add? You know, one of the things I will say, and maybe not anybody else said this to you, but thank you so much for this. This is awesome. That you know. Uh, I see the individuals who actually are in my neighborhood. I, I have a group home right down the street from me, and they come and play basketball at the park. That's my exposure. You know, if if I wasn't in this field, that would be my exposure. We need more of this exposure. We need people talking about this population and making it a population that others see as not scary or not something that they shouldn't, you know, uh, have opportunities to work with. You know, and as much as we, as much as you can, know about them. Thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah, the idea here here is is really to to bring more awareness to this to, to this field to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to the need to continue to work and build upon the the, the great successes that we've already had, but in this field. But there's a lot more to do, a lot lot more things to do, and people out there can be part of it. Um, there are so many different ways to get involved in this field, uh, from direct support professionals to nursing to pharmacists. Uh, to you know, advocates, whatever it is, there's so many great things you, that you can do, and, and I would I would agree. Get to know people with disabilities because they are people first and foremost. Um, so, thank you both for joining me today. Really appreciate it, and I uh, look forward to uh, talking with you at other conferences as we move along this highway of many conferences this year. Great. All right. Yes.